I'm trending away towards gold just because I think gold is going to do incredibly well in the monetary debasement that's coming. But I think Bitcoin is going to do much better than that. And so as an investment manager, my job is to earn the top risk adjusted return for my for my clients. And I view Bitcoin as, as a better risk adjusted return than gold um, this far into the game. And now having a lot of the risks in my mind in Bitcoin gone away. I mean, perfect example. One of the biggest risks, I think, in Bitcoin until the ETFs. Um, you know, was TradFi looked at it or, or most investment pools looked at it and said, how can we invest in, Sailor made this point, how can we invest in something that we think the government might shut down? And, you know, when the government approved the ETFs, I mean, they more or less gave the green light and said, well, we're not going to shut it down, at least not now. Um, there might come a time when, you know, they're in distress and they decide they want to shut it down. That's a whole different discussion, but that's a few years out. And so, you know, I think with the, with the endorsement of the ETFs and the recognition that those funds are now going to flow into it, this is no longer just a niche form of sound money. This is mainstream sound money. And it can really, in a, in a meaningful way, compete with gold. Larry presents a compelling case for Bitcoin as the superior investment for risk-adjusted returns, especially in the face of monetary debasement. With the advent of ETFs and governmental nods towards Bitcoin, it's clear that the cryptocurrency is moving from a niche to a mainstream investment option, potentially rivaling gold as the go-to asset for sound money advocates. But what does this mean for you, the investor, the enthusiast, or the curious bystander in this digital age? Before we dive into Larry's insights, remember to hit that subscribe button and like this video if you find our content valuable. It's a mistake that a lot of investors make, I think, and that is to say you've got a gain and you're feeling good about it and you think, oh, this can't last and maybe it's overpriced now and therefore I'll sell it. Um, I bought Microsoft in 86 when it went public, 14 times trailing, growing 40% a year. And I made, I don't know, three times my money on it. And I sold it for a, a logical reason, actually, because it was the only money I had to make a down payment on a condominium and I wanted to own a condominium. So, um, but had I held on to it, it, you know, it, it turned out it went up another 4,000 X and I, and I missed all wow. of that. You're right. And wow. you and, bought and, at and, what and, price and you sold at what price? Well, back then it was probably $15, but split adjusted. Wow. Um, it was, it's a six cent, it was a six cent stock. And I think Microsoft today is trading at 200 and something. So, Oh um, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's crazy. I mean, I left a ton of money on the table, but, but who could know? And by the way, most stocks aren't Microsoft. I mean, you know, the right. reason that reason that worked, you know, the killer stocks, if you really look at some of the greatest stock returns that have been made in the last 30 years of investing, they've generally been in the base layer of something that grows and spreads to become ubiquitous. Mm -hmm. And they've got kind of a monopoly position and a network effect. And, and I, so I put in that bucket you know, Microsoft was probably the first one. Google is another one. Facebook is another one. You know, all the fangs. Um, and then, you know, Bitcoin right here is buying Microsoft in its first five or 10 years of existence, right? Yeah. I mean, this is the base layer of the new form of money and ultimately everything will be denominated in SATs. So um, yeah, and Saylor asked me the question. He said, well, you know, you sold it. And he, he made the point and I think he's right. There are a lot of people who don't understand this asset. They're going to buy it. And it's going to work and they're going to feel great. And they're going to think, hey, I made three or four times my money. And they're going to sell it, yeah. not realizing that it's going to just keep, you know, as he says, it's going up forever. I mean, this thing, you know, in, unless we're wrong about this being adopted as the base layer of money, and I see no evidence to suggest that's the case, this, these coins will be, you know, 100,000, then they'll be 400, then they'll be a million, then they'll be 4 million, then they'll be 10 million, you know, and, and, and the time frame on all of that is probably 20 years because, you know, Microsoft started in, in the early 80s, and here we are 40 years later, you know, that it's the multi-billion dollar company that it is. So this this doesn't happen overnight. But the point, you know, as you raise is you don't want to sell, you know, it's it's like Manhattan real estate, as he said, you, you don't want to sell a cornerstone asset that can't be replicated um, and, and can't be debased just because you have a profit in it. Right. I mean, that's just that's the lesson. And the other one I forgot to mention, Amazon, same story. I mean, yeah. you know, these, these networks um, and, you know, we all know uh, Metcalf's law and the way a network's value increases geometrically as, as the users increase mathematically. And so, you know, arithmetically. So I mean, they just they, they gain enormous value. And so this is why and, and I don't sadly, I don't think I don't think most investors really understand this. I mean, and I have to say, I, I give myself pretty low marks for not really understanding the value of these. And, and Saylor did get it because he played in the dot-com thing. And I was involved in the dot-com thing. 
And what I should have re- what I should have realized is that there are going to be network businesses built here that have enormous value, and I should have started looking for them. And I was looking for them. I looked at as an example. I looked at Amazon, and I thought this is really interesting. It's not just books anymore. He's selling all kinds of stuff, but he wasn't making any money. And so I right. took my trad I took my trad fi lens, and I said, "Hang on a second. You know, I'm a Warren Buffett guy. I want a low PE stock that's going to end." There was no profit and little did I realize that what he was doing was, you know, gaining share and that, that eventually he would have the entire market and then he could generate a profit. So, right. you know, it, it's and, and so I missed it. Uh, I completely missed it. In our journey through the investment landscape, Larry Leopard draws from his personal experiences, highlighting a common investor dilemma, the struggle between cashing in on gains versus the potential for unprecedented future growth. Using his own story with Microsoft as a backdrop, Leopard underlines the significance of recognizing base layer assets, akin to cornerstone real estate in the digital realm. This perspective isn't just about past missed opportunities, but serves as a guiding light for understanding Bitcoin's unparalleled potential. The digital age presents us with a base layer of a new form of money, with Bitcoin at its core, promising growth that mirrors the early days of tech giants like Microsoft, Google, and Amazon. These comparisons aren't just about financial growth, but emphasize the revolutionary impact of embracing a digital sound money standard. Sound money would, would restore, you know, sound values in the country. And the country is way, way, way off the rails. Anyone looking at it, anyone living in it can, can understand that and see it. And although there are a lot of good things about the country, there are a lot of ways we've gone in the wrong direction. Um, yeah, when, when we get to the stage where we've got, you know, a Bitcoin standard or a sound money standard, things are going to be incredibly good, uh, much, much, much better. But we need to get there and we need to, you know, it's, it, there's a chasm that we have to cross and we're not, we're not even, you know, out over the middle of it yet. We're just getting started on that crossing process. Yeah. But once we do cross it, it will make a, it will make the world a much better place. So, uh, you know, I'm quite bullish about the, the way the world is going to look and, you know, for your generation, my kids' generation. Yeah. But yeah, what you've described, they're all suffering. They're all in their 20s. They're like, hey, dad, there's no way I'm ever going to be able to buy a house. And I get it. And they're all doing fine. Um, and I get it. I mean, it's, you know, the, the, the system is really, really broken. And, uh, you know, that's, that's why it's, you know, as we all say, right, fix the money, fix the world. I mean, you know, and, and you've got all these, you've got all these political people pointing fingers at each other, not really, many of them not really realizing what the core issue is. And the core issue is the unsound money, right? I, I try and avoid the politics a lot. And I, I'm not a fan of either side, you know, blue, blue or red. I, I lean uh, libertarian and, and, and therefore I, probably lean, you know, towards RFK Jr. Um, but, you know, it's it's interesting to me, like the Trump, I mean, Vivek must have gotten to Trump a little bit, right? Because he's he no longer hates Bitcoin. It's not a scam or a fraud anymore. Um, and the other thing I think is going on is it's becoming a big enough of a voting block that, yeah. you know, who wants to who wants to piss us all off? Right. I mean, <laughs> it, you know, and I mean, politicians are nothing if not self-interested and worried about votes. And now that you've got an ETF, you know, you've got a lot more people in the country who own some. And so, you know, if you're a politician, you start saying, hey, this Bitcoin thing's bad, et cetera, et cetera. Well, shoot, maybe I'm not going to vote for you. So I, I think that's that's all it is with Trump, in my opinion. I don't think he understands what it is. Um, I, I think it's just pure calculated self-interest on his part. Biden did something recently that just and this is I'm pretty sure it's Warren, not Biden. But it just annoys the shit out of me. This whole notion that they're going to try and tax the miners 30 percent on their energy consumption. I mean, that would just right, kill the mining. Right. I, don't, I don't think it'll ever get through and it would just kill the Bitcoin mining you know, industry in the United States. It's going to send it it elsewhere. overseas instantly. Yeah, I mean, tons of jobs and economic activity and et cetera would all be lost. I I think it's a non-starter. I don't think there's any way they'll get that through. Um, But but look, it, 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 you know, it strikes me that over time, um, the the politics are going to reflect what the on the ground conditions and the on the ground conditions are going to be Bitcoiners are doing well and Bitcoiners are a big voting block and Bitcoiners are going to be wealthy when these coins are worth a million dollars a coin. And, you know, I could easily see, you know, I mean, I, I have the sense that Saylor kind of sees himself as, as a really unique individual with a, with a higher purpose. I think he's going to be a, a huge historical figure. And it wouldn't surprise me at all to see him run for president in eight years or 12 years. I also think he's probably going to be the richest man in the world. And knowing what I know about him, I, I actually think I actually think that would be an incredible, incredibly good thing for the United States, because I think he's a very strategic thinker. And I actually think he's a, a kind and generous human being who would Agree. Uh, who, who would actually do a pretty good job as, as a yeah. president of this country and, and maybe restructuring, you know, kind of the broken politics that we have. I mean, 
we clearly need a massive political restructuring. We need term limits. We need money out of yeah. politics. We need rank order voting. Uh, there, there are a ton of solutions. I mean, it's the founding fathers had a great idea and the politicians have managed to kind of stray quite away from that idea. Uh, we, we need to get back to the basics. Larry Leopard's vision extends beyond the immediate financial gains, touching on the profound societal implications of transitioning to a Bitcoin or sound money standard. This isn't just about economic policies or investment strategies. It's a philosophical and practical roadmap towards restoring values and addressing systemic flaws in our current financial system. The potential of Bitcoin to reframe our economic landscape is vast, but it requires a collective understanding and effort to cross the chasm that lies before us. The journey towards a Bitcoin standard is not just a financial revolution, but a societal shift towards more equitable and sound monetary practices. Don't forget to subscribe and like this video if you're keen on staying updated with the latest insights and discussions in the world of cryptocurrency.